Um, I thought for a while about what I was going to talk about at this conference and had various ideas bubbling through my mind. And then I thought, hey, you know, free radicals is such a great concept. I'm just going to run with that um, and follow the concept of free radicals from its origin in chemistry and follow a chain of events and just kind of see where it goes, which is a bit like the process that both artists and scientists often enact in their own work. You start with an idea and you see where it leads you. So what we have on screen here is a free radical. It's the hydroxyl radical. And for those of you uh, who know science, uh, what you will know is that free radical is an incredibly important term in chemistry. It refers to uh, a huge group of um, molecules that have a free electron, uh, th that have what's called an unbound or free electron. So what we have here is um, what's called the hydroxyl radical, which is oxygen bonded to hydrogen. But oxygen has those little dots in the outside of it represent the electrons in the shell of the, the outer shell of the oxygen atom. And you see that there are one of them is paired to the hydrogen, two of them are paired to each other, and one is left open. So what we have here is um, a molecular group that has one, as it were, free limb, desperately wanting to bond with something. <laughs> and it's this, fr the, the term radical refers to the fact that it's a whole group, which is a widely used term in chemistry, and the free refers to the fact that there's a free electron which desperately wants to bond with something. So this is what makes free radicals highly reactive. And now many of you probably know of the term free radical because we were all told we should eat our antioxidants and our <laughs> omega-3s to clean up the free radicals in our bodies. And the reason for this is that these, these free radical things are very dynamic, very energetic, and they do actually cause a lot of reactions in our bodies, which is actually what you want if you're a living thing. Living things are dynamic and something has to power them. And free radicals actually form a lot of e extremely positive functions in our body. But they can also, because they're highly reactive, um, cause problems, you know, mutations, etc. So on the one hand, you do want free radicals in the body. The other, on the other hand, you don't want too many of them. So chemists have spent a long time, the, the understanding of this dates back, back to, the, to the late 19th century when chemists were really trying to um, articulate the formalities of how the atomic elements worked. You know, it's re, it was really one of the most important um, processes in the history of science, figuring out what are the basic atomic elements, you know, everything from gold to hydrogen to sulfur, and how are they organised in relation to each other, which is what produces the periodic table, and how do they react with one another, and of course that's an ongoing process. So the understanding of this basic chemistry is actually foundational to the modern world, everything from, you know, petroleum to plastics to synthetic dyes that are used in paints, etc., and all the wonderful fluorescent and bright colours that we now have are due to chemists' understanding of how atoms and molecules are forming at this very basic level. But I want to come back to the free radicals themselves, because as I said, free radicals are molecules that desperately want to bond. They've, as it were, they're a bit unhinged. They've got this kind of arm out there, desperately wanting to grab onto something, and they need to react in the world. So what I'm going to do is take this as a bit of a metaphor and introduce you to another group of free radicals. And why isn't that moving on? Uh, we might... It should be... Ah, here we go. Okay, so um, for about 30 years, I've been collecting theories of physics and chemistry by what I call outsider scientists. These are people who, some of them have training in science, some of them um, have actually PhDs and usually in things like engineering, but a huge number of them don't have any training in science. They come from a huge range of disciplines like some of, I've met architects, judges, doctors, car mechanics, 
um, people with no training whatsoever who love science, want to engage in science. They read books like Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time or Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe, and they say, it doesn't make sense to me. I believe that nature speaks a language that the ordinary human being should be able to understand, and I'm going to have an articulation of how the world works, i.e. a physics and chemistry of the world that makes sense to me and that I believe will make sense to everybody else. And so beavering away in their basements and backyards is a huge cohort of what I have come to term outsider physics or outsider science, which is like the scientific equivalent of the great term outsider art. And for 30 years I've been collecting these theories and I now have probably three or 400 of them. If you go on the internet now, you can find thousands of them because now in the age of InDesign and you know, electronic publishing, basically anyone with the, right, you know, with the right software can get on with creating their own theory of science and publishing it online. But the ones that I actually admire most are the ones that I used to get periodically in the mail that were handwritten, hand-drawn and lovingly presented to me as I have thought about the universe, Margaret, you are a person who I think will comprehend that I am the next Einstein, or usually they're the next... <laughs> usually they're not even going for the next Einstein, they're the next Newton, and you as a science person will take my theory to the world and the world will wake up and all will be right. So these are some of my... Uh, they're not very bright, but can, I, I don't know if you could get a general... Hopefully you get a general sense that slides are a bit pale, but um, this one is one I particularly love. This, this one is a quantum theory of um, matter, and um, this guy sent me this like six-page handwritten original. He didn't even send me a photocopy. He sent me the original. <laughs> and it's basically a quantum theory of, of the world, which also includes black holes in space and time. And it must surely be a word of wisdom because not one word do I understand. <laughs> but th this particularly intrigued me. So this is his notion of how um, he, he did the beginnings of molecules, he says there. And in the middle of that, it says lump form. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it is, you know, one way or another, you know, that's kind of the, the ontological problem, isn't it? From nothing, the lump fall. <laughs> so, anyway... Um, this one I valued very much. I, I did write back to him. I never heard from him again, unfortunately, but um, I was just deeply honoured to have, to have got this handwritten masterpiece, which I <laughs> treasure mightily. But I'm going to spend the rest of um, my talk talking about a particular outsider theorist. His name is Jim Carter, and he is um, the hero of a book I wrote on this subject, outrageous product placement here, it's called <laughs> Physics on the Fringe, and it's basically um, a sociological study of outsider science, uh, outsider physicists. And to my knowledge, it's the f it is it is the first I, I know of no other person who's done a sociological study of outsider science. But there are actually people now beginning to write about particular instances of outsider scientists. And some of you might have been aware that the great um, writer Lawrence Weschler, who wrote the wonderful book Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonders about the Museum of Jurassic founder um, David Wilson, Wren has a new book out called Waves Passing in the Night about uh, the film editor Walter Murch, who, along with having three Academy Awards and doing the sound for things like Apocalypse Now and the Godfather films with Coppola, along with that... Um, Walter spends his free time developing his own alternative theory of physics and Wren's book has just come out about that. My book um, stars, as I said, this man, Jim Carter, who's perhaps uh, the most radical. I, I, I would honestly say that I think Jim is the most free radical I have ever met in my life. He lives, he lives life more fully on his own terms than anyone I have ever met and he has a DIY ethos at the heart of everything he does, whether it's designing and building his own house personally, whether it's restoring lovingly these beautiful old prizes that he has, 
whether it's digging wells and sewerage lines because he runs a trailer park up outside Seattle in this incredibly beautiful piece of land at the top of what's called the Green River Gorge and perched on top of this gorge, Jim has a large chunk of land where he's built a trailer park that has about 120 permanent residents and they do it, he, Jim oversees everything from the building of the, putting in the sewer lines and the electric lines to clearing the sites and it's kind of like a little medieval situation happening there where Jim's the kind of benign <laughs> medieval overlord with his villagers <laughs> and within this universe of the Green River Gorge, this is his house, which he built all by himself. Um, and you may or may not be able to quite see in that photo, but basically the thing about this house that's really marvellous is that there's not a single straight line in the whole <laughs> No wall is plumb, no up, no, you know, cross, cross beam is ever at right angles. And you know, this is kind of indicative of Jim's view of life. He actually, at first I thought, you know, it's just that he's not a very good builder. And then I thought, oh, no, no, he built the whole thing himself. He's, you know, it's a two-story house. He built it by himself. He can't not be a good builder. And I asked him one day and he said, no, he said, you know, I actually do believe that if things are straight, if everything's straight, then things are not quite right in the world. <laughs> and I thought, great. So, as I said, Jim is the star of my book. And the, the subtitle, the book is called Physics on the Fringe, and its subtitle is Smoke Rings, Circlons, and Alternative Theories of Everything. And <laughs> Circlon are there because Jim has a theory of matter that is based upon what a particle he calls the circlon, which is this, uh, we'll get into a bit more, but these ring shapes. Jim believes that all matter in the universe is made up of these ring shaped particles that he calls circlons. So the circlon is at the heart of his theory of matter, molecules, and how you know, all matter interacts. But he also has a theory of energy, and um, this, this is a lovely diagram. Again, you, you might not be able to read it very clearly, but what he's showing here in this diagram is it's a spiral, but it begins with the smallest energetic thing in the universe, like a very, very tiny photon. And it goes out gradually mapping bigger and bigger stars of energy until you get to all the output of all the stars, the last n units, is all the output, all the energy output of all the stars in the universe since the beginning of time. And on the way through this diagram, he has some lovely things like um, the energy of the Titanic sinking. But my <laughs> favourite one comes about halfway through, it's about up there. And it's the energy of a bumblebee moving at half the speed of light. <laughs> now, why on earth it's a bumblebee and why it's half the speed of light, who knows? But, you know, one, one has to bear in, has to think that, you know, can this possibly be unrelated to the famous My Monty Python song about can a bee be not a bee if half a bee is not a bee due to an ancient injury? So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the half a bee song, but... I can't help wondering if Jim Bumblebee moving at half the speed of light reflects that. Anyway, here, here's Jim's basic diagram of the creation of the universe, which we can go into a little bit more in discussion if anyone's interested. And, of course, gravity. No one with an alternative theory of physics can claim much credibility without an alternative theory of gravity, which also we will go into in the talk if you, I mean, in the discussion. Because what I want to get on to is basically Jim's alternative theory of matter, which relates to chemistry. So he has published whole books, uh, dozens and dozens of books about his theory, and not only does he write them and lay them out, but he does all the diagrams and, the an and animations that he's produced to go with them. The other theory of physics, a unified theory of matter, space, time and gravity, all in one, all encompassing, all erasing, all physics, that has been done since Newton, or surpassing, I should say. So, Jim's theory of matter begins with his insight one day that at the heart of matter was these circular coils. And basically, so imagine, <coughs> imagine you had a coil of wire, like um, a slinky. 
So imagine you had a big long slinky and you wrapped it around into a circle and it would be able to vibrate and it's flexible. And so that's due to the fundamental insight of what the matter is made up of. Now, th then you can ask, well, what's the slinky made of? You know, if you, if you go down to the level of the wire. And in Jim's theory, basically, um, the wire itself is a, is, a, is a coil. And then you go down further and the wire is a coil. And he has, in his physics, he's articulated very specific things about how matter behaves with energy that he believes relate to the, f to the first three levels of this coils within coils within coils. Uh, when you ask him, do you think it's coils all the way down, he says he thinks probably it is, but he's <laughs> he hasn't really you know, done the specific physics of that, but he's pretty sure it's coils all the way down. And... These circlons are not arbitrary in size. They have a particular size which relates to various properties of, you know, various quantum properties of matter, which, you know, we don't really need to go into in depth. But, but you know, Jim reads physics, at least to some degree. Um, I should say he has no education um, beyond high school. He did one course in college. Um, he did a physics course in college and he got very upset because he said, you know, they're just teaching me the theories they want me to know. I want to do it for myself. I think being told the theory of the universe is cheating. It's like looking up the answer in the back of the book. It's, there's no point if you're not figuring out the world for himself. So after one, cor one course in physics, he decided this was not for him, that the only way he was going to get to a true theory of the universe was to do it for himself. So as I said, the, the, everything is made up of these coils um, they're the basic particles. But how do you get atom? You know, you've got a whole ray of atoms, you know, everything from hydrogen to helium, the simple things, and going upwards to gold, uranium, etc. How do we get that? Well, in Jim's theory, the circlons link together. So one circlon, a single one, is the simplest atom, hydrogen. Two circlons is the next simplest element, helium. Three forms lithium. And then you go up the periodic table, and you it's sort of so it's kind of like a little bit of a subatomic chain mail mesh. So you, you're kind of gradually building up the periodic table through the whole chain mail mesh, and so you can you can you can continue to represent them all in circles, which Jim has done animations of all of that. Um, but you can also um, just represent them symbolically which, you know, at some point you need just to go to pure symbols rather than keep having to represent three dimensions. And what you get is the entire periodic table. <laughs> so, the, the, this is Jim's alternative, you know, representation of, of the periodic table. And, you know, what entranced him about this is that he, he believed that in order to understand the, the periodic table, that one of his great inspirations was that there had to be some mechanical structure that would build up in such a way that would represent the, the, what was happening with matter. And because he be, Jim's a car mechanic. He's an absolute genius with machines. Mm -hmm. He grew up on a farm. He can fix and build any machine. Um, he has his whole fleet of these beautiful old Chryslers and Cadillacs that he was stuffing mm -hmm. in his store. So... He believes that the world is a mechanical system and he spent years looking for a mechanical system that would naturally emulate the periodic table and he found it in this circlon structure and you see this one up here, um, this is, this is uranium I think, um, but what you see the way it sort of goes out like a snowflake, it's got a kind of natural sort of a pattern. And Jim was playing with these little circuits. He'd hit upon the idea that the rings, that the atoms, the basic particles were rings. And he was playing with the rings and taking pictures of them. And he realised that there was this natural pattern that the rings made, natural in his mind, that emulated, that when you laid it out, it emulated the structure of the periodic table. So that was his, you know, great eureka moment, that he had naturally found a mechanical system that emulated this very particular structure of the periodic table. So Jim is absolutely convinced that this is the true theory of the universe. Now, he came to this theory in the early 1970s 
when he was working as an abalone diver off Catalina Island. And so th there used to be a huge abalone industry off Catalina before people like Jim <laughs> fished it all out. Um, so Jim, Jim does, that's the one thing I've ever seen Jim uh, express a little bit of remorse about, that, not that he personally fished it out, but he was part of the fleet that did. But when he was an abalone diver, you know, he spent a lot of time under the water in a scuba suit, and it turns out that um, divers can blow circular bubbles underwater. So, you know, you take your, your aqualine, you just sort of take a big scoop of air, and you, you can blow bubbles, ring bubbles. And sometimes um, dolphins have been observed blowing these bubbles. And this was where Jim got the inspiration from, in part, because... These rings form naturally and they're incredibly stable. And once they form, you can actually make them bounce off one another. They're incredibly stable structures. And that was what gave him the in inspiration. <laughs> this, this is, an, uh, this is an, uh, one of his early books from, this is what, one date to about 1973. He used to do these incredible zine like books. They're just beautiful. And, and he has a whole sort of as it were, taxonomy of these things, and bublons is one of his structures. But so he came to the idea that at some point <laughs> that he wanted to test this idea of the circlons. And, you know, if they were real at the atomic level, then there ought to be some way at the human level of doing experiments with them. And so he realised that actually smoke rings are the same form of a structure as a bubble underwater. It's the same thing. In physics terms, it, it's called um, a ring vortex. And it, exactly the same physics is going on when you blow a bubble underwater as when you blow smoke rings. So Jim decided, this is his backyard, that he'd build a smoke ring generator, which actually, he spent a long time working on how to build a smoke ring generator, but it's actually very simple. Um, you just need a big container, in this case a large garbage can, with a hole cut in it so the smoke can come out. And you need a flexible membrane, like a, just a piece of rubber. So you fill the can with just... The, this is, in fact, just dry ice you need to get from a disco machine. Um, and you, you just read the disco machine and shove, shove it in the can <laughs> until it's dry ice. And then you tap on the top of the thing and smoke rings come out. <laughs> and so Jim thought that this was a way that he could test his ideas about, you know, the way smoke rings behave and therefore, you know, if they behave the way that he thought that, that his theory of atomic matter behaved, that that would constitute some sort of proof that his theory was right. So could he do things like bash the, circlon, the smoke rings or circlons together? What was the size and the structure of the smoke ring? And according to Jim, Jim according to Jim, all of the the smoke rings naturally form in the same proportions as the ones that he envisions at the atomic level. So that was a very good proof at all. So we're just going to end um, on... You too can see proof of the wonders of smoke rings. And I should say, let me get this. Or it's this one. Uh, this, this footage comes from a documentary that my former husband and I made about Jim Carter. So during the late 90s, from about 1987 to 2000, we spent a couple of years going up and visiting Jim and filming the evolution of his smoke ring experiments. So uh, there's lots more about this, but I'll just show you the end result of our most magnificent smoke ring session. Thank you.
Uh, so, so we'll end there, um, uh, but there's plenty more bits that I could show you if anyone's interested. We have maybe another five or so minutes for talks and questions and comments and...